we publish exciting, accessible, contemporary, vibrant writing from Ireland and around the world. And uh, I think that the, the readers that we have today um, really exemplify that. So we have Aoife Casby, uh, Catherine Talbot, Tom Fowler, Dervin Houston, and Clara Kumagai. So Aoife Casby works as a writer, editor, and visual artist, and is currently studying towards a PhD at Goldsmiths University. She was shortlisted for the Fish Short Story Prize 2016 and is completing a collection of short fiction. She's been awarded literature bursaries by the Arts Council and Galway County Council. <coughs> um, when we're going through submissions at Banshee, we often write little notes to each other about what we think of the stories. And my, my initial reaction to Aoife's was, this is wild and delightful. And uh, I stand by that assessment. It's a fantastic story. So please welcome Aoife. first three pages take about six minutes. <clears throat> I stole the boot. It is definitely a boot and I stole it. Just the one. It's up there in my wardrobe now. It smells of need. I take it out occasionally, more often than I used to. Sometimes I take it out to try and get rid of it. Sometimes I take it out to just... It's a high red leather boot with a zip. Heels that do that do things to the instep and to that curve in your back. You know the type, the sort of boot other women wear. I stole the boot from an old friend, a woman who used to be a friend. I met her in, hang on, her name is Uma. I met Uma on that street by St. Peter's. Hi, Jane, she says. Jane, that's my name. Hi, I say, this is a coincidence. How are you, Uma says. Well, this is a coincidence, I say again without really meaning that it is a coincidence. We have a hug, the kind that neither of, one, one of us wants to have, but that we're both thinking the other expects. Then, quite suddenly, we separate and let the blush spread between us. I talk again, although at this point I should have really just walked on, but I didn't. I can't remember the name of the street. It had full, leafy trees. It was summer, and the traffic hummed rather than blared. For some reason, I remember a yellow car, a Volkswagen Beetle. You don't expect them in that colour. So where are you off to then, I ask, because I don't know what else to say. And I eye the shopping bags Uma has hanging from her hands. Oh, so labelly, I think. Well, I live here, Uma says, and she points up the sunny tile steps, keys in hand, a real awkward like, and the bags bang against her breast. Then she says, shopping bags. Like I had asked her about them, and she gives a smile that twists her nose and jostles about her top lip in a way that would make, make you want to stop her smiling. Treating myself, she says, with previous recession style, and fix her head, which shifts her golden hair and exposes her eyes. I like Uma. She's just, well, she's just that type, you know, she'd be easy to dislike if you had the attitude where any blonde city girl with a bit of money and that accent is fair game and airhead. It's better to make up your mind about her before she speaks. What are you doing here, Uma continues, meaning what was I doing in that part of town? And I don't tell her that I was going to see a dentist that I picked from the golden pages because I liked the sound of his name. Visiting friends, I tell her, you wouldn't know them. Coffee, asks Uma, a little reluctantly, I think, and she starts her waddle on up the steps. I shadow her as if it were the most natural thing to do. She's smaller than me. We used to live together, the students. We weren't two girls that in the normal scheme of things would be naturally thrown together. Yeah, we got drunk loads of times and shared men and even kissed and groped one another more than a few times. I reckon it's the first thing both of us remember when we meet and we'll never talk about those lovely kisses, which is a pity really, because I think we'd probably get a great laugh out of it or more. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. You have to see these boots, Uma says, and she grabs a bag from the floor and flurries out, leaving me in the kitchen feeling a little more relaxed now that we've gotten over the first round of small talk. I walk around the kitchen, touching her things and opening the neat, filled cupboards. Managing a restaurant, she said. A funny thing for a woman who studied French and English to do, I thought, but didn't say. A high-class sort of place, though, I looked it up. They had lobster in the menu and put real gold into delicate desserts. I told her I'm in personnel and that I see it as a stepping stone or else, you know, like a filler in, a way to make money. In fairness, I don't make a lot, but I needed her to know I had plans. 
I must have been a barrister for my talk of positions and careers. Neither of us was going to talk about men or marriage or kissing. That was clear. And when the conversation got dangerous, that was when she went to try on the boots. Anyway, there's no sign of her with the boots, so I go to look for her. Without thinking about it too much, without any agenda or intention, I just walk into the corridor. There are no carpets in her place. All of the floors are wooden, and it looks like nice wood, but it gives the whole apartment a sort of controlled feel to it, like an empty home. I'm creeping about the place. I say creeping, but it's just that at this stage, I don't call for Uma or anything. Just go down the wide hallway, testing all the doors. Don't ask me why I don't call her name. Uma, such a full, fleshy mouthful, but I don't. It's a big place. Four doors are doors off the corridor, so I just open the first, peep in and whisper her name, so that even if she is in the room, she might not hear me. My heart is beating so that it talks to me. And then the second door, and there's still no sign of Uma. The door at the end, the one that faces the front door, is slightly ajar, so I go to it and push, mouthing her name without saying it aloud. It's kind of creepy when people do that even if they don't mean it. You see it in the movies the whole time, people stopping outside doors and listening, and you know that something bad is going to happen. Well, that's the way I'm at the door, and I know at this stage that room is behind it. And I open it a little more, just a soft push with my hot fingers, and Uma <coughs> doesn't see me. I watch her in the red boots and her sweet, <coughs> sure zips. I just stand there watching her, in her fuck me boots that give out more of a night fuck you thing. And I can see that Uma knows that. I stand there, just breathing, so alive, waiting for Uma to see me watching. As I gaze, I realize too that Uma was never going to come to the kitchen with the boots. It's way too private. But I see her anyway. There she is with her double chin and her chafed thighs and her having this look on her face, all golden and delighted. And all she did was put on red boots. It's the movement of the mirror that does it. I watch her standing there in her surprisingly old-fashioned, not white bra, her new boots tight up to the middle of her shaven calf. It's the movement of the mirror. That's when she notices me. Uma is strutting, half-naked, with the boots on, up and down in front of her short reflection. Her knickers and the rest of her clothes in an ugly pile on the floor. And then she reaches out, and moves the mirror and the wardrobe to get a better view of herself and catches me with my eyes full of things I can't see. There is a moment when the universe cleaves passionately open, reveals itself and its opportunity, but I am ill-equipped for this. I am ill-equipped. Her cheeks are as red as the leather that is holding her up. She reaches to pull her clothes from the ground and as she does, she falls, topples from the boots, lands on her plump thighs and arse, with her legs open and her coiffed vagina facing me. It's such a stupid situation. I should help her to her feet, I think. I should grab her dressing gown, lead her to the bed, meet her eyes and, oh, so wordlessly communicate harmony to her. Uma sits still on the floor. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, our next reader is Catherine Talbot. Uh, living in Dublin, Catherine is undertaking an MPhil in creative writing at Trinity College. She was shortlisted for the Fish Prize 2016 for Richard's Grief, which is the story she's going to read for you now. Her short story, Shrinking from Life, was longlisted for the inaugural Colm Tobin International Short Story Award and the Fish Prize 2015. Um, I was blown away by Catherine's story when I first read it. Uh, Richard is everything you want in an anti-hero. And even though it's a couple of months since I first read it, I'm still thinking about him. So please welcome Catherine. Well, I'm actually reading three and a half pages. Too long. The snow swirls as though some under other some supernatural power. Energy moves Richard's snow crystals all over his back garden. He spies the robin and silent beside him. He stoops to clean the debris from the chairs. He is interrupted by the priest calling him again. Richard reluctantly attend, agrees to attend the meeting about him. He finds himself in the toilet, pissing out the tea that has been forced on him by the woman priest helper. He doesn't trust her. He 
goes back into the room. It has high ceilings, and Father Dan's frantic clapping is getting louder by the minute. Everyone seems to be joining in. He sees no option but to start clapping himself, a twat in religious ecstasy. After the mayhem, Richard sits in a grey plastic chair that reminds him of school. He can feel his bum squishing out through the hole at the back. And then he shot himself through the brain. They had shotguns, you see, on the farm. A woman starting the discussions, more clapping. Blood all over the paint pots in the shed, the vegetable seeds destroyed. Thank you, Rose, says Father Dan. They are all crying now. He is caught up in it despite himself. Maybe it's the emotion from Rose. He just doesn't know. My name is Richard. When he hears the response of, hello Richard, together as a group, he thinks he's going to wet himself. It's too much. He's playing a part in shambolic fakeness. He hears their silence, listening to him begin his tale. Teaspoons clinking against the sides of cups of tea. Frida, well. He's struggling to find the right words, to express his confusion, his sense of loss. He has a sachet of sugar between his fingertips, bends it over and back, straining it until it breaks in two. Sugar on the table. What was she like? A lady covered in a turquoise mohair cardigan asks. He wants to please her, provide her with a decent answer. She was beautiful, thin. I'm sorry, I don't know why that is important. She was a mirror of her fragility, breakable. I don't know what else to say except that she's gone. She was strong though. But you said she was fragile, the woman says. Contradictions are my weakness. He looks to Father Dan for help. Father Dan perched looks me a tipping into Richard in front of this bereaved group. Richard feels like his heart has stopped. He feels a pain in the exact location that his heart ought to be in. He sits down, weary, blocking out the clapping. Don't forget me, I don't want to die. He is awake, but dreaming of her in the morning time now. He can picture her clearly, feels the haunting of her. How are you feeling now about your loss? I dreamt that I saw her in the mirror. She looked drugged. That's what we term visitation. You are not ready to let her go. You are the psychologist, you tell me. Anyway, it's not my loss, it's her loss. Don't you see? Sit down, Richard. I mind that table with you. The glass isn't attached to the legs. Sorry. He settles back down, the bold schoolboy, wrapped on the knuckles. The leather of the chair, cool and hard, under his backside. You should try breathing exercises. Oh, and you should try and go out with other women. All is luminous in his heart, his bad luck about to turn good. He can fix himself through breathing. He looks up to the trees, counts the nests, his breaths. Holy Thursday announces itself. He buys hot cross buns, a gloomy start to the day, but now interspersed with the sharp aquamarine strips of sky. The clouds part away from each other, like avocado halves ripped apart, exposing the hard, slimy stone. He cuts his hand badly, trying to open an avocado. He spies the hard, stray cat in the garden. He despises cats, evil creatures, shitting long, running tubes of stinking diarrhea, yellow, puce. Frida always adored cats. Not surprising to him now, the strays are likely to attract each other, like with like. He views Frida now as a hopeless, ghostly stray. He looks at the Easter missile, announcing the schedule for the fervent Catholics up on the hill. He decides on the stations of the cross. Nothing like a bit of self-flagellation to get the blood up, his breathing corrected. Richard, how are you fixed? Did you take that job with the lawnmowers? His mother shrieks down the phone. Yes, I did. You don't sound too happy about it. It's the way you described it, as if it's just a case of helping out the local petrol station. There's more to it than that. Yes, I know. Sure, you know yourself. Actually, I don't know myself. Did you even look out the window today? Mother, did you witness the glory? High up there in the sky? Shocking beauty. Who would have thought? On my own doorstep, all for the taking, but Frida missing out, missing out on all of it. A waste indeed, but she made her choice. Richard, do you hear me? She slipped. I'm going to miss out on all this incredible weather when I start out with your man. But won't you be outside? Isn't it beside a garden centre? Yeah, the one run by the trannies. You've lost me there. Ma! Don't call me ma. 
Ma, lend us a bit of cash to tide me over. To Uignis are, Ma, you survive. The job will do you good. Out there in the elements. I suppose there will be a yard. I suppose. Best of luck with it. Dressed up, wearing his old docks from the back of the wardrobe, clicking his feet across the yard, he feels the other guys watching him. His phone rings in his pocket. The manager motions to him to ignore it. Rule number one, Dick. Don't take private calls during working hours unless it's an emergency. A point taken, but how do I know it's an emergency or not if I don't answer it? Rule number two, don't be smart. He gets stuck in for the rest of the afternoon, thinks of his boobies. Nobody really bothers with them. He doesn't mind. He's already given a few of them names in his head. Beefy for the fat one. Gangly for the underfed one. He spends his lunch break picking out his fingernails and smoking his newly acquired pipe. He senses the boss isn't happy with the smell of it. Want to join us? Gangly asks. Okay, what's the game? Poker. Sure. He begins his battle. Name's Jim. The fat over there is Derek. Unfortunately, two kings, ogres. Gangly sneers out the instructions. Richard feels as if the summer is coming in. Bit of heat now in his wrists, what with the poker. He takes off his joker, revealing his tartan work shirt. So what's your story, Jim? Nothing much to report. A spider owls around. He watches Jim kill it with a cigarette. What do you lot do for food? There's a fridge over there. Help yourself, Jim says, pointing inside. He opens the fridge. It smells of rotten eggs and sour milk. He makes himself a cup of lion's tea. Picks the little globules of sourness from the milk. He makes his way back outside to the game. What's your story? asked Derek. I'm trying to learn a new trade. Get on. I was in advertising, but I got out. Too many suits. With the shift over, they go for a pint. I feel different after one day. I can't explain it. It's the air, Derek gesticulates. My fingers are fucked. Richard bites out the lawnmower grease from under his nails. He meets Patrick later. The two of them talking about going bird watching and then just going, even though it's getting dark. On the beach with a torch, Richard shows Patrick where he'd stood in the syringe. They never get the pricks that drop their shit all over the place. Tell me about it. Frida didn't care either. The spray from the sea shooting in. He feels it on his face, pulls the flaps of his hat down over his ears. Do you think about her? Always. But I'm not doing anything about it. Just going on. Not, you know, dwelling on her drowning in dirty water. Not thinking about her breathing in stinking swan crap. Not thinking about the beer cans and the traffic cones floating over her eyes. He sees a man further up the beach fixing a tripod into the sand. It is close to darkness. Richard takes the beer can from Patrick's hands. The beer feels icy going down. He almost chokes. So much, Catherine. Uh, so Tom Fowler's debut story collection, The Method, won the Scott Prize and the Edge Reader's Prize. He's the author of the critically acclaimed novels What Lies Within and That Dark Remembered Day. He edits the literary journal of short fiction and lectures in creative writing at Plymouth University. The second collection of stories, Dazzling the Gods, is being crowdfunded at Unbound. Um, I've been a fan of Tom ever since his first collection, The Method. Um, and this wonderful point of story is taken from his forthcoming collection, Dazzling the Gods, which I can't wait to read. So, I can talk. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, big thank you to the editors of uh, Banshee. Um, I know how hard it is to put together these things and to get them out there, so um, do give it uh, your, your full support. Um, Wow, what a turnout. I get to say I come from a, a place called Plymouth in southwest England. If you try to put on an event in a library on a Thursday afternoon um, and put £50 out on the seats and a bottle of wine for everyone, you get three people still. That's only because they probably got lost in the library somewhere. Um, yeah, so this is the first third or so of my story um, from my forthcoming collection. Uh, the story's called An Arrangement. It, it is one of those late summer evenings in England, heady and languid. The garden's drowsy scent marshals in me nostalgia for the dozen or so Augusts we have spent here. Seasons laid down deep in the brain's security, more felt than known. 
of droning bees drunk on one of the colossal lavenders behind the old rockery, the day's heat subsiding, yet still irrefutable. I picture the summer house where swallows nest each year, where we would converge as afternoons lapsed to imbibe each other's days, its exterior, I am told, in disrepair. And beyond this, quilted fields stitched with hedgerows of yellowing hawthorn, the sparrow-haunted rowan richly buried, fragrant walks that should have been more prized at the time. The radio said our summers will become wetter now. Last winter's flooding will be commonplace as our climate enters a new phase, one we have cultivated, if the science is correct. The low sunlight illuminating my wife's shoulder as she sits at her dressing table is somehow both mellow and scalpel sharp. Some trickery of the new medication, I suppose, which whilst inhibiting some of the pain, distorts reality a few degrees. She is precise in her movements, a well-honed routine to enhance a beauty that was, she insists, late to flourish, and which is only now, perhaps, beginning to wane. Men age so much better, she is prone to say it accusingly, although perhaps there is altruism here, in case on some level I am still preoccupied with how handsome or otherwise I am. I want to speak to deny the reminiscing further indulgence. Not because of her imminent departure, a vignette that has occurred monthly for the past year, but there is something to be marvelled at in this dance we are able to perform. It would be simple for her to get ready in another room, as if my involvement, albeit one of mere observation, is somehow vital, consensual. Some months, she even solicits my thoughts on a particular dress, a combination of jewellery I think works best, and I advise, with due sincerity, delicate in my judgment, fulsome in my praise. Perfume, though, is her realm alone, as if it speaks to a level of intimacy neither of us can endure, its selection seemingly flippant, a final flourish of decoration, rather than the olfactory manipulation it aspires to be. Whether she imparts more scent than the times we dined out together is hard to say. Perhaps further adornment takes place in the taxi, a courtesy extended to me, one of several that have formed unbidden. You can ask me anything and I'll tell you, she said at the start. I know, and I have been tempted, not from a rising paranoia or raging jealousy, more than I fear hearing some detail would arouse me on some level, allow vicarious lust to play out. But I don't ask. As lovers in our thirties, I would have tore open any such rival, or at least threatened to, confronted him with animalistic fury before collapsing a tearful wreck. Such confrontation is beyond me now, but I sense no real desire for it. I am not so naive to mistake this for some zen-like enlightenment, or worse still, a sixties openness to communal loving. I always wondered how that played out in reality, unadulterated by the rose tinting of hindsight, was everyone who partook accepting of such frivolous hedonism, the sharing of orifices and organs, or was homicidal behaviour kept bay only narcotically? Are you okay, she says. You seem distant. I, I was just thinking, I lie, do you regret not having children? This isn't a fair question, and could be construed as my attempt to mar her evening. Her oh, darling, we've spoken about this. I know, but you might have changed your mind. We were trying, right up until I became ill, which I suppose was rather late in life, at least for a woman. Careers had consumed us, the time never right, and then when it was, not enough blue lines in the little window. Tests showed no reason for our fallowness. It was simply a matter of perseverance, of sending enough seed swimming in the right direction. But the next batch of tests we endured I endured, were of another order entirely. I'm content, she says. I don't really think about it these days. Absent of all segue, she speaks of the dinner awaiting me, cauliflower cheese, that she'll bring it in as she leaves. I make a joke about it being my turn to cook, but it's an old, well-worn line, and goes unacknowledged. You've got your back, Lafayette, she says. 
Yes. And you can take more naproxen in at 10 o'clock, or two of them. Six months ago, when my mood found a new Nadir, I began hoarding pills with no more intent than to experience the sense of control it offered, some small reclamation of autonomy. Ever since she found them, their administration has been piously governed. If you never ask me, I say, what you want for dinner, or whether I regret not having more children. She sighs at my mute outbreath, escaping despite herself. Can we talk about this when I get home? Will that be before or after the sun is over the yard arm? I can't help myself. I don't even feel the level of spite it implies. It's as if I want to try it on, being a shit, like a jumper. I can't cancel now. We agreed. If you don't want me to go, you have to give me a few days' notice. It's courteous. This word seems to me inappropriate. Their arrangement requiring a more squalid lexicon. I want you to go, I say. I can sort myself out if you pass me some tissues. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next up we have Derva Houston. Her fiction and poetry has been published in Word Legs, The Incubator and Icarus. She is currently completing an MPhil in Gender Studies at Trinity College, Dublin. And when I first read Dervila's story, I was struck by her humour and insight, but most of all by the authority in her voice. I think she's um, a young writer to watch, and we're delighted to be publishing her. Thank you for the little bit introduction. Um, I'm going to read roughly first half of my story, which is called Witness. I came home to find my parents in love. They were holding hands at the arrivals gate. It was disorientating, really. It's not as if my parents weren't in love before. I'm sure in the early days of the relationship they were. Neither of them ever mentioned it, so it's hard to say. I thought they would break up as soon as I left, or at least one would have an affair, something. They needed a third person. They needed me. It's how they generally communicated throughout my life, with me going between the two, separating and joining them. Our favourite subject was whoever wasn't in the room at the time. Even as a trio, we could talk about the other through winks or knowing races of the brown. Now the two of them regard me steadily, as if out of one set of eyes. They'd taken up smoking, in the way some couples might take up golf. They shared one pack throughout the week. You'd swear they're the first to do this, be in love, the way they exhaled at each other across the living room. Not that either of them cared to ask, but I'd also been in love. He was very nice, very Canadian. It was all new for me. The boys I knew before were the types who couldn't look at you unless they were three points in. But there was this tall, solid thin chatting up, polite, mind you, so much so that I almost didn't cop what was going on in the fiction section of the Bloor Street BMB. So yes, I think I fell in love. I fell in love with his life at least. He was second generation Slovenian, good Catholic stock. Every few weekends were spent out in Mississauga, place four in the and little old Babishta at the top of the table. It was quite Irish actually. I bundled into his world and I loved it even when he was annoying or distant or wore socks with pool sandals. But the whole thing was, at times, a little too jovial. The sex had a puppyish backstabbing quality to it. It was more like we were players on the same team. Neither of us were too upset when I told them my visa was running out. We had a laugh on the drive to the airport, and he kissed me sweetly before I joined the queue for security. I thought I was right to go home. I'm in the shop, buying their cigarettes, no less, when I see him. The urge to slip away unnoticed takes over, as it usually does, when I'm confronted with anyone who used to know me in school. But there is limited space to hide here between the sliced pan and the small, dated display of toiletries. He's there in the queue, a basket in one hand, and a little girl gripping onto the leg of his trousers. She looks up at me. <coughs> Hello, I say to her, thinking it best to discern the situation this way. He turns around and stares at me. Jesus, how are you? He can't remember my name. I knew he wouldn't. Caroline, I say. Caroline, of course. How are things? How's college going? Say hello to Caroline's eyes. I smile at her. 
She continues looking at me, hand bunched to her corridor. I graduated two years ago, actually. I'm just back from Canada. He turns to walk to the counter and puts his basket down. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Cold though. You get used to it. Listen. He tucks his purchases, paltry, lurid sliced ham and a box of eggs, under his arm and pockets his change. I'd better be going. This one gets a bit fussy if we don't keep moving. Good to see you, Caroline. Say bye bye, Sai. Sai says nothing. He shrugs at me and smiles. A soft smile. A good smile. I remember that. I put my carton of milk down on the counter. Twenty Mayfair as well, please, I say to the, the, to the cashier. She looks beyond the door. She looks at me beyond. She looks beyond me to the door. <laughs> um, God, she breathes. That poor man. What's wrong with him? His wife was killed in a car accident about six months ago. Left him behind with that small girl. Terrible stuff. She leans forward conspiringly, as if to tell me more. Now, 10.95, please, Lady Arden. As I walk home, I think there's something about a man who's been touched by sadness. It makes him different. You'll never find him in a pair of cargo shorts down by the prom with the child, his soft wife looking on at them from the rocks. No talk of pairs or DIY projects around the barbecue. A man like that is different. You see him walking down the street and you know. You just know. He'd been a teacher at my school, higher level English. He was young enough, newly qualified when he started, which was in my final year. We couldn't help but love him, obviously. You could tell he loved us back too. The homework handed in on time, laughing at his jokes, the way we looked at him. Not that he ever took advantage of it. There was one girl, Natalie, the year below. She wrote him a letter asking him to run away with her to England in secret. He was so kind, handled it very well. We were furious, of course. She wasn't right in the head at all. Remember what she did with Alan Heaney on the retreat to knock in the second year, somebody asked. We did. We remembered. She moved to a different school after Christmas. We loved him even more after that, but in a slightly dampened way, because by then it was time for us to move on. Some of us to university, or a hairdressing course, or the job at the Montessori. I'm not trying to justify anything here. These are just things I think that should be noted. Background. Evidence. Thank you. Her writing has appeared in Room, Event, Megaphone, and Icarus. Her short fiction is forthcoming in The Stinging Fly, and she is currently completing a young adult novel. She is from Ireland, Canada, and Japan. When I first read Clara's story, Ringworm, I absolutely fell in love with it. And I loved how skillfully she conveyed the story through the eyes of um, a young character but also how she fused the traditional with um, a fresh outlook and I think she has a great writing career ahead of her. Please welcome Clara. Hello, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the Banshees for publishing Ringworm, which is what I'm going to read from now. She was a child who moved worms out of harm's way and released flies caught in spider webs. She would shriek without shame at anyone who dared squelch a slug on your boot. She had a loud voice. One evening she watched Granny swing the limp body of a mouse into a wet field and she screamed and screamed. She always sprang the traps with a spoon but had missed that one. Granny gave her a swift slap on the arse and an hour of exile. She was locked out of the house while Granny looked out at her from the kitchen window vindictively eating jelly babies. When the hour was up, she stormed back inside. You shouldn't have killed the mouse. He was only small. He ate my things, Granny said. But you just took my jelly babies, didn't you? She stamped her foot at the injustice of the world. I shouldn't have done that, because they weren't mine to eat. Yeah. Well, that's how I felt when the mouse ate my cup of chocolate, except I didn't do a poo in yourself raising flour, did I? She was forced to admit that no, her grandmother had not. So you see, and I saved you some sweets. The child chomped on the remaining jelly babies, a red, an orange, a dusty green. She saw the sense in Granny's words, but it still wasn't right or fair, because Granny was bigger and stronger than the mouse in the first place, and now by eating the jelly babies, she was somehow implicated in it all. The next morning, she passed the time by letting the calves suck on her fingers. They had a fierce vacuuming suckle. 
She felt the slick ridges of the roofs of their mouths and their warm tongue roughness. Get out of that now, will ya? The uncle said. The calves had been taken from their mothers so they wouldn't drink all their milk, and he was mixing them a white watery formula substitute. She wiped the thick calf saliva on the front of her jacket and stayed out of his way, patting the black and white dog. She had a tempestuous relationship with Patchy, who had once bitten her hand. Granny said it was because she'd just gotten a haircut and Patchy hadn't recognized her. She didn't want any more haircuts after that, and so she and Patchy had undergone a slow reconciliation. Patchy licked some of the calf saliva from her hand and then looked away. She decided to go talk to the cows. When she approached their field, the cows ambled loosely towards her. She climbed the gate and leaned her chin on the top bar. Don't you miss your babies? She asked. If you all went together, you could probably get them out of the sheds. The cows looked at her placidly, flicking their long purpley blue tongues into their wide, wet nostrils. You don't even care, she said. They gave a bovine shrug and sh showed the whites of their eyes. The child hung on the gate, leaning back until her arms were stretched out, until she couldn't go back any further. A week later, she developed ringworm on her face. I told you to stay away from them cows, Granny said. They rub their arses off that gate. The child re returned to the mirror again and again. The ringworm spread in a reddish purple raised rash across her chin and halfway up one cheek. She couldn't see the rings in it. It was more like whorls and spreading spirals, a crust of disjointed ripples on her still water skin. She thought she looked like a monster. The cows didn't look like this when they had it. They lost their hair in patches and were left grey and dry underneath. She was glad she hadn't gotten the ringworm on her head because her hair would have fallen out and no doubt Patchy would have bitten her. She can't go to school like that, the uncle said. You don't get the ringworm from neglect. Granny stood at the range, salting and buttering things cooking in pots. What other child in the school has it? The uncle was scouring his hands, scrubbing with the nail brush. And what if another child gets it? We'd be in for it then. I can give it to other people? The child had enemies. The ringworm could herald a new age of germ warfare. Don't you touch anybody else when you've that in your face. Do you hear me now? The uncle loomed over her. She muttered a reluctant yes, and Granny put a hand on her shoulder. Granny put down plates with chicken and potatoes and soft, defeated cauliflower. Have you heard from her at all? The uncle was saying. His voice sounded pillowy, filled with potato. Last week, and where was she? Croatia, I think. One of those countries, anyway. And the child, who can lay claim to her? She's no trouble. How do you think she can travel around like that? The child looked at the cauliflower, speared on her fork like a tiny, fainting tree. How do you think she's affording it? It seems she meets nice people. Ha! The uncle's laugh had no joy in it, only potatoes still. She folded the phrase away. It seems she meets nice people, and stowed it into a corner of, corner of her mind, thinking that one day she would know why the uncle had barked that laugh, and why they all now sat in the heavy quiet. Granny told her to get into the car. Are you taking me to the doctor? Don't be ridiculous. Granny drove erratically, punching the horn every time they went around a bend. She stopped outside a house that was low against the road. Granny knocked three times. Come on in there, a voice said. Granny pushed the child over the threshold first. There is a man sitting at the kitchen table, an old man, not as old as Granny. How are you? Granny said in greeting. Grand, he said. She's got the ringworm, Granny said. I can see that. He stood up tall with the curled shoulders of someone wanting to be a bit smaller. I'll wet the tea. Granny sat at the table. The house smelt like boiled things. Do you think it's going to rain? He asked as the kettle steamed and clicked. It's always going to rain, Granny said. Ah, yeah, he sighed. The man set a mug down in front of Granny and a glass of milk in front of the child. He drank it down in one go. Like a suck calf, he said. She loves the calves, Granny said. Isn't that where she caught it from? The poor calves, he said. Come here to me now, Alana. Go on. Granny pushed her forward. She stepped up until she stood between his knees. He smiled at her and put his hands on her chin, her face small enough that his fingers covered her ears. You'll catch it, she warned him. I won't that, he said. She gazed upwards. Over one of the man's shoulders was a small TV on which the news played mutely. 
Over the other was a picture of the Sacred Heart, with Jesus in soft colors and smooth hair and one hand raised. The lamp below him shivered with the red light. Jesus' heart was bare and ringed in thorns, and she wondered, did that hurt? The man was murmuring a prayer as he held her face, and she looked at him and saw his eyes were closed. She closed her eyes, too, and let her head hang in his hands. There now, he said when he stopped praying. He took his hands away, and her face felt cold without them. She'll be grand. Granny's face tightened, and the child wondered if they were still talking about her. Granny laid two notes on the table. I ask for nothing. He said it like a spell. I know. Goodbye, Sukkah. Bye. On the way back, it started to rain.